Mm, so let's start. So uh, today we're going to have a relatively informal discussion about how the Economist site, which I'm sure you all know runs on Drupal, um, how the Economist site works. We're going to talk about uh, things like how the teams work together, uh, how the scrum process happens. We're going to talk about how DevOps works. We'll talk about performance. We'll talk about infrastructure. So what we're going to do is we're going to kind of go through the general architecture and kind of created a framework that describes the major aspects of the site. And then uh, different members of the team will talk about <laughs> different pieces. And then when we're done, uh, we'll take questions from most of you. <laughs> we'll take questions um, uh, from you about what you're particularly interested in. And to say again that you know, we had predominantly a uh, development team, but we also, um, uh, but the UX team is here. And so feel free to ask questions about anything that you're interested in um, when we're done, even if it wasn't a topic that we touched on, that we touched on here. Um, so I'm Diana Montelian Dupuy. I am um, a developer at Four Kitchens, and uh, I worked on the Economist project as part of the Four Kitchens team, which was also known as the Janus team, which was also known as the Austin team. And I think Austin team is is where we're going to where we're going to stay. And um, let me want to introduce yourselves, or do you want me to introduce you? You want to introduce yourself. Okay, all right, so um, <laughs> this is John Jones. Uh, he's a developer <laughs> and an overall um, harassment major from uh, the London, <laughs> London team. And Ernest Barry, who's from a developer on the New York team. And this is Rebecca Moss, who is the scrum master for both the Austin and the New York team. I have no idea how she manages, how she manages um, that. And Angelo Rapole, did I say? Rapole, right? Angelo Rapole, who is the user interface developer. Um, he, he is our front end guru. I mean, he's, he's the, yes, the god of all things, of all things, uh, Aaron. And Judah Anthony is a developer in New York. And Dominic Laycock, a developer in London. And Caillou Sachs, who is the one who keeps the entire infrastructure going single handedly. Again, I really have no idea um, how, 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 but he does. Or as Eric says, we're just that good. Um, and this is Sharda Ram, a developer from New York. And as you saw, um, Eric, the CTO, snuck in the back. We weren't sure he was going to be able to make it. Uh, and Anna, Anna, can you say your last name for me? I'm Nicole. I, I would have butchered that. <laughs> and Owens, I can say, right? Brian? Right, Brian Owens. And from London and New York team. Yep. <clears throat> so we'll... Uh, and I'll, I'll explain how the teams work a little <laughs> bit more. Let me just give you a brief introduction to The Economist Online. So The Economist was first published in September. September? Mm, it must be almost end of the day. <laughs> in September 1843, to take part in a severe contest between intelligence, which presses forward, and an unworthy, timid ignorance obstructing our progress, which I would say we need more of in the U.S., in May 2011, The Economist Online had 6,421,376 unique visitors and 32,565,298 290, page views worldwide. Which, even though I'd been working on the site for over a year, those numbers still seemed huge. I, I, I really had no idea. And then this does not include the iPhone and iPad app download, which Two million plus, but that's an older number. What what do you guys think it is now? And is it? Mm. It's a lot more than that now. And probably not twice. Maybe three. And and an app. I sorry. I'm Android. I'm an iPhone exclusivist. So the way that development works is there's um, there's a, an economist team in London mostly represented here, and there's Economist team in New York. And then Four Kitchens also has a team, the Austin team, uh, and all three teams uh, somewhat coordinate and somewhat work um, you know, on their own uh, to make the development team. Also recently was added what we've called the Continental team. Um, the Continental team who've come in to work on a, a new feature that's going to get built, and so they've been, they've been deep in the code review process, right, for the, 
for the last uh, month or so, and they're still sane, so that's good. And um, we keep in touch by Skype, by IRC. There's a Google Groups um, that we call the Dev List that has all kinds of, <laughs> has two hours worth of emails to read every day, and also all the code review part goes to that. Um, we also actually speak to each other, but that's less common. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> Um, and then <coughs> in, there'll be the develop, you know, the, the, the literal developers on the team, but also like for the Austin team, uh, Danny in New York is the designer and he will be the one that gives to us exactly what the look and feel of, of any functionality that we're adding or uh, in the case of of um, newsletter integration, there's someone for production that comes into the team. So other um, non-strictly developer people will come in and out of the teams depending on the kind of work that the team that the team is focused on. Is there any other role that usually gets mixed in? Designer, UX, production. It's about right. Um, occasionally, occasionally editorial people. Okay, and then okay, and so Rebecca Moss, she's going to talk about. Um, about the Agile Scrum process? Sure. Um, at, at Economist Online, we use Scrum, which, which if you're not familiar with that, is uh, an Agile project development framework. Um, it does come from the rugby term. Um, and basically, the, the analogy is that we're moving the ball forward together as a team. Um, and essentially, we work in uh, two-week iterations. Um, at the beginning of every two weeks, the team gets together with, um, with the product owner, which I'll talk about in a little bit, to look at what are the top priorities um, in the backlog list of, of features that we want to accomplish within a project. Um, and then the team meets daily for 15 minutes for the team to coordinate with each other uh, for what they're going to do for that day. And also very important in that is to raise anything that is uh, slowing down or blocking the team. That can be, um, hey, nobody's code reviewed my stuff. I need somebody from one of the other teams to look at it. Or it might be my development environment is busted. Um, and um, so we look at problem solving either within that, that, that daily call um, or we have an action list of, uh, of things to follow up that day um, to keep things moving forward. So that's one of the very important things. Um, to, to moving forward. At the end of every two weeks, the team does a public demonstration, uh, which the other people in our, um, our group, not just the developers, but, but editorial production, uh, marketing, anyone's invited to come watch, where the team demonstrates completely working software that is ready to release. Um, and um, that is the, the big piece of what we're trying to do with, uh, with iterations, is that um, we're getting um, high value work, chunking it into very small vertical slices with all the pieces, the, the back end, the front end, and uh, database, all pieces, so that at the end of the two weeks we have something that we can say, this is done, this is ready to release. Um, and um, the roles within the team, we have, uh, as Diana was saying, we have a cross-functional team. So it's not just the developers, we have um, UX designers and occasionally some of their roles come in. Another important piece of this is that the QA is done all within the team. It's not that um, the developers just do coding and that's it, throw it over the wall to, to a separate testing department or someone who's, who's separate who does the testing. The team themselves, um, and I think somebody else is going to be talking more about our automated testing. We think about that from the beginning, and, um, and it's the team's responsibility not to deliver code, but to deliver um, working product. So that means that, that it's tested, just enough documentation, um, and, um, and that that's, there's nothing else that would hold it up from actually um, going through the release process to live. Um, the second role within our team is the product owner, and um, this is one of the key features of, of, of Agile and Scrum, which is that you have someone who is a representative from the business who is working with developers day to day on, um, to make sure that what's being developed really does match with what the business needs are. Um, so, uh, so that product owner is attending the daily scrums, the team is showing things work in progress so they can quickly get feedback, and ultimately at the end of the sprint, the, the product owner is, is the decider, is the one who says, okay, this looks good, I accept this, um, and, um, and, and, and it's done. 
so, so that's a very key piece that it's not development working in isolation from the business, but you have someone who's the voice of the business and the voice of the customer who is working with them every day. And actually that's one of the challenges a lot of organizations have when they try to move to Agile is that's, that's a big commitment to, to, have, um, to have that kind of integration with the business. And then the, the third role is the Scrum Master, which is, which is my job. Um, and the Scrum Master's role is it's a little bit different than a project manager. It's more a combination between a coach and a referee. Um, I facilitate all of the plannings and the dailies to help keep things moving along. But then, um, as I said in the daily, one of the important things is the team um, raises any issues or things that are blocking them. Um, and, and the Scrum Master's job is to remove impediments. So that's a big part of um, what I do on a day-to-day -day basis is going to the daily meeting, um, hearing what's, what's working and not working with the team that day, and um, identifying what are things that are keeping us from meeting our goals. And then I take that and, and, and try to move things forward, get the right people talking to each other, and um, so that we can continue on with our work. Um, and then just one, the one last bullet about business value. Um, there's, there's a slight misconception sometimes that agile, um, agile processes are about getting things done faster and where that might be a side effect if you have everything going smoothly. Really the focus is on delivering the highest value uh, of features sooner. Um, so if you compare this to Waterfall, where you might spend a couple of months in discovery, a couple of months in writing up a whole big technical spec doc, and then giving it to, um, giving it to a development team who works on it for three, six, nine months um, before it's, it's released out to live. In this, we're, um, we're working with a product owner who has, who because they're from the, the business side, um, they have a good conception of what are things that are going to be valuable. Um, what uh, of, of this big mass of, of, of features that different, maybe different stakeholders are asking for, um, prioritize it, and, um, and we look for how we can um, chunk it into smaller bits that we can completely release and get out um, and not wait six months for the whole thing to be released at once. Um, so that's really an overview of of, um, of what we do. Excellent. So um, yeah. yeah, I think that's great. And we'll okay. come back to um, uh, questions at the end, so which I'm sure they'll, um, that's always okay. something people have lots of questions with. So sure. questions about. Um, so that, that works, right? We, can you, will you be able to hold your questions, do you think, or do you want to stop in between each piece for a few minutes? All those who can wait till the end, raise your hand. Okay, let's <laughs> wait till the end. Okay. <laughs> So, um, so DevOps, uh, and I would say that in terms of development operations and also in terms of infrastructure, that the Economist Project has for the most part now set the standard for the way big Drupal websites operate. Um, you know, and it's being repeated now again and again on, um, on other large sites as they, as they adopt Drupal, so that's, that's uh, gratifying in terms of that the work has ha was successful and has been tested and also means that to a great extent the team got to figure out all of the problems involved mm -hmm. in the system to get the system get the system working so I was thinking do you want me to put do you want me to show all of the bullets and you can go one yeah, and go rather than cue me when it's done yeah. okay All right, so uh, those are a few of the things that we're going to talk about and Rebecca's um, gone through how things work from a scrum point of view and this is going to be slightly um, how things work for a developer what's it like for the development team that works at the economist and um, we'll start off by saying that uh, we use bazaar as our source control system how many people in here use bazaar bazaar kind of a minority people All that the economist <laughs> people <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> anyone using git yeah, lots of people using Git, good. And SVN? Sorry. Yeah, that sucks, <laughs> man. So we used to use SVN and we decided to uh, move to Bazaar. And one of the things that we really liked about Bazaar was the fact that using Bazaar, we also have access to a tool that goes with it called Launchpad. So our basic workflow, as Rebecca said, we break things into stories and stories are chunks of work. So 
the first thing that we would do would be to create a feature branch that's going to contain all the code that we're going to do as part of that feature. So that means I can work on my branch and not affect anyone else, which is a good thing. At some point, we need to actually get that branch approved. And one of the things that might be slightly unusual about The Economist is that no single piece of code will get made live without being reviewed at least twice. So what Launchpad allows us to do is when we're ready, when, when I'm happy with my code and my branch, I basically propose merge it and it appears on Launchpad with a diff and everyone can log on and have a look at it, see what code I've produced and leave their comments about whether they think it's good, whether they think it's ropey, whether they think it's a really bad idea and I shouldn't have done it that way at all. So um, our coding standards internally are exactly the same as Drupal core. So for people that join our team, uh, we always say, don't be surprised if you put your first branch up for review and someone says, hey, you missed a full stop from the end of that comment. <laughs> That's normal for us. We expect that. and. And to be honest, it, can, it works for us. So the process is that I will get someone within my team to review my code. And when they're happy with it, I will seek one of the other teams. Because as we mentioned, we have three different teams. So I will seek the, the review from someone from one of the other teams. So that may be someone like Judah in the New York team. I go, hey, can you have a look at this code? Let me know what you think. And we have a dialogue via Launchpad discussing the code what's good about it, what's bad about it, what we might have done better, why did you consider this approach, that kind of thing. And it allows us as a development team to learn from each other and to make sure that the code that we produce is of kind of the maximum quality that the whole team got to as a collective. So it's a really important and quite powerful tool. And um, testament to that is is the fact that we, we produce code that generally does not have bugs, does not need releases to fix. Um, it tends to be robust code. So it's a, it's a really good model. If you haven't had a look at Launchpad, um, I'm sure there may be a Git equivalent. Uh, I strongly recommend having a look at and checking that out. So um, <laughs> trunk, stage, and live. Trunk is basically what we take our feature branch branches off from. Trunk is pristine. There is no bad code in Trunk. At any given moment, at the drop of a hat, we can release Trunk to live and be confident that it's going to work, there's going to be no problems. And that's kind of important. It means if something comes up that's really critical and the site is has a problem, we can release probably within I'd say about 20 minutes we could get a release out because we have that knowledge and we have that certainty that trunk is good and trunk is always good. So stage. Stage is uh, Kalyu, our system ops guy, will talk later about our environment. But stage is basically identical to our live site. So we have a lot of testing environments on the way to stage that we can test things in. They're mainly cloud-based, and they're not representative of our live site because they can't be, because they're in the cloud. So stage is really critical for picking up those tiny little bugs and glitches that might come in from a very, very specific environmental configuration. So basically how it works is every Thursday, we will take a cut of trunk, and we will push that to our stage environment and then every developer that worked on a bit of code that's in that release will go onto stage and test and make sure that that works. And of obviously, anyone else in the business can also see that environment and test and make sure they're happy with it. And on the Tuesday following the Thursday release, we will actually push that code to live. So that's pretty much how that works. Uh, testing, every developer is responsible for identifying the best type of testing for his code. So um, I believe 
Judo. We'll be talking a bit later about testing. Be Ernest. Ernest, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so Ernest will take you through uh, the various testing tools that we have. But basically, the, the choice of which tool is most appropriate for that particular bit of functionality comes down to the individual developer. Uh, and finally, uh, vendor branching. Uh, Bazaar does vendor branching really, really well. Uh, so any module that we use on the site sits in its own branch in source control. So if we need to upgrade a module, it's very simple for us to take the latest release or even like a checkout of source control and basically merge that into trunk and Bazaar remembers where that module sits, what directory it was in, all those kind of things. It becomes a very, very simple operation to just merge it in. Um, and that's pretty much all I have uh, for the moment. So if anyone has any questions, like Dana said, let's wait till the end. And that's it for me. Hey, awesome. All right. Git does, um, I'm, I'm just starting to work on a project using um, using it. Git has a review process. It views GitHub, right? GitHub has a review. You can do code review through GitHub. Yeah? Yeah? Git users? No. Anyone using Git that has a code review process? The GitHub process? Yeah. Okay. Okay, so we'll, uh, let's talk about the, the theme layer. The, um, the Economist theme is, it's certainly the most complicated theme I've ever personally interacted okay. with. I try and say, we try and leave the theme to the actual people who know. So, uh, a quick overview of our, our theme layer. Um, it's quite basic, actually. We have two main uh, themes, Sorry. one for the public face website and one for the admin interface. Actually, we use Garland for the admin uh, section. And uh, for the public face, we use um, a version of the 960 grid. It's an adaptation of it because when we implemented it, we didn't want to redesign uh, most of the components, so in order to prevent some issue with that, we adapt the 960 and we made it a little bit wider, so it's not that big difference. Um, and uh, it's, it's working quite, quite well for us, to be honest, and uh, everyone is quite happy with it. Uh, in terms of the structure of the uh, theme layer, we haven't changed much. It's quite the default behavior. So most of the template files are sit uh, in the theme folder together with the CSS and the JavaScript files. When it comes to uh, modules and in-house modules, uh, the, we change a bit the approach. And all the template files, CSS and JavaScript files, needs to be placed inside the module. That will help us to prevent having uh, CS files that live forever in our website whether, when we decide to disable these modules. And uh, of course, the downside of that is that we have a long list of CSS files as well as JavaScript files, but then they get aggregated, so it's not a big uh, deal. It's also, it helps us to find the uh, specific set of styles when we, we need to and um, uh, sometimes this uh, actually has another downside that is that we have to duplicate some of the styles um, because uh, some modules use styles that are the same as other modules and uh, this is an issue that uh, we will try to solve and try to solve in some way that uh, is not giving us a lot of repetition basically and uh, um, this is what it says about the modular CSS. Um, about the future, we are we started in November 2010 to implement HTML5. Uh, the first step was to change the doc type, uh, and then with the, with our first project about the user registration, we started to implement the new input types, new attributes for the form. Uh, um, section of the registration and um, um, in the next months we are going to start changing the structure and implement the new um, semantic tags and also try to focus on the on the uh, uh, responsive design so that it will help us to uh, deal with different uh, screen sides uh, desktop mobile and so on 
Um, I think that's pretty much it about the theme layer and uh, how it works uh, in the economies. Did I? Oh, okay. It takes a minute to, to do this. Thank you, Angelo. So now we're going to talk about um, testing. So uh, part of the challenge um, has been organizing the right kinds of tools to be able to meet the needs of um, meet the, the systematic needs and um, also to make sure that we're finding things as we go along. So there's been kind of a, a creative uh, a creative bringing together of different kinds of tools to try and match all of the different uh, possibilities. So, Ernest, do tell us about Hello. that. Hello. Um, yeah, I'm going to try and go through the tools first and then talk about how the tools work together. Um, so, we use Selenium for our uh, functional testing. Um, is everyone here familiar with Selenium? Um, and we use simple tests for our unit testing. Um, as far as, like Dom said, it's kind of up to each developer as opposed as, as to which tool to use for which case. Um, I'll go into hand testing um, after I talk about the tools. We use Grinder for our load testing. Um, who here is not familiar with Grinder? It's a Grinder is a Java load testing framework and you write your test in, in Jython. So every developer has to be able to write a test in Jython. It, it's pretty straightforward. Um, and then I'll talk about the team sign off before each release. So those are the tools we use for testing. Uh, and the way and the way we use them obviously is when you branch off, you decide which tool is going to be best to test this piece of um, piece of functionality or piece of uh, code or which, whichever feature you're working on. And then so the hand testing goes in terms of a um, you know you as yourself as a developer test it, um, and then when it goes into your proposal f um, on Launchpad, obviously the tester then takes in your code and runs a test to make sure it runs. Uh, is okay on their environment and then we have the stage release and so the third hand test that goes on is that each developer then goes in the stage environment and kind of tests different features or you yourself go on the stage, stage environment um, because that's where all the code kind of inter uh, interacts as a whole to see if it's still working there. Um, so that kind of goes on to the team sign off before each release. Uh, we in Hudson we have all of our tests automated. Uh, when you when something's merged to trunk, it fires off a build, which then runs every single Selenium test that we have in the system, and they all must be green before we actually sign off that that uh, that, that is ready to go. Um, you should be doing that yourself, um, but so that's kind of our team sign off is that you then run your tests and all tests Selenium tests and unit tests all run. Um, now the grinder test is a little different. Everyone writes their grinder tests and we run them and we get results back from them. Uh, if you're not familiar with, with grinder, it gives you results of the mean times for each of your tests and, and how, it's, how it's performing. That gives us kind of a KPI and then we might get a message from CalU or SysOps guy who actually gets that graph and he might, be, he might say something like there's a spike you know, in one of the tests. You, know, you might want to look at that to see what's going on there. So that's what Grindr helps us to do is to kind of keep um, a baseline of how the system should perform and also kind of to help look for spikes before we actually release it to trunk. Um, so I think that covers most of our testing. I wrote down some notes because I always forget things, so pardon me while I go over them to make sure I covered everything. Um, we use PHP unit to fire off our Selenium test. That's our interface, which is kind of the only way to do it. And also we've written our own kind of internal custom framework uh, to help um, you know, kind of encapsulate the general functionality that we want to do with our Selenium test. And we've also set it up such that every test has a video attached to it. So if something does go wrong, we can go straight to Hudson and we can look at the video to see what happened during the test to try and diagnose why it failed. Um, I think that's it for testing, I believe. And I'll answer questions at the end. Um, we also use a, it's a slightly modified version of Grinder, which if someone's curious, I can go into later. But um, that's about it. Okay. Yeah. Be um, Judah next, right? So, and and I want to reiterate one of the things. I don't know why I'm beeping here. Um, is that when if I'm working on a feature branch and then I merge that into trunk and then the Selenium tests are not all green or this uh, are, mm -hmm. aren't all green, it's my responsibility. It's each individual's uh, developer's responsibility to figure out why the tests are no longer passing and to fix them so that it's a collective responsibility of all of us working on the code that, um, you know, that every time we're adding code, all of the tests are still passing. So 
which is a dance. Mm -hmm. It's a dance. It's a dance. Yeah, we there was all a dance. brief period of hell where <laughs> we queued up a bunch of branches, but never actually ran selenium tests against them. And then when we merged that into trunk, every single test failed. And so for a week, we were trying to scurry around all fixing tests and not getting a thing done because we have this policy that nothing gets deployed unless all the selenium tests are green. That's why Dom has such confidence that um, our trunk can be deployed. So uh, yeah, just kind of a, a note to keep your eye on those automated tests. And a warning for new developers, when Elliot joined our team, he spent the first two sprints working on <laughs> any time anytime the Selenium tests stop working. We're like, Elliot, can you look at the test? But it's good to, then you know, you know, you know, yeah. OK, so automated. Automated. Oh, uh, yeah, this is. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So, uh, speaking of um, Selenium tests and those other kind of things, uh, if ever you guys worked in uh, large environments, you know that there tends to be a whole lot of scripts that you tend to run to try to automate, deploy, all those kind of things, and uh, you get your little uh, toolkit of scripts. Well, Sometimes it's a lot easier and a lot more transparent to have a GUI and uh, a logging interface and what ultimately what you're looking for is an integrated development environment and are not an integrated development environment and continuous thank you continuous integration system and that is what our uh, Hudson slash Jenkins slash Hudkins is um, Hudkins is our nice name for um, the distribution that is Jenkins but used to be Hudkins. Um, regardless, um, basically what it does is it allows you to run code on your on the command line. Uh, ultimately, that is what it boils down to. Um, you can run arbitrary code. You can run Drush commands. Any of you guys n don't know about Drush, I recommend you looking it up. Very great. Very good. Um, you can run a lot of things that would have ultimately be run on cron. Um, when we started uh, putting things into cron, uh, we found that it wasn't, at least in Drupal 6, it wasn't always the most elegant solution. Um, uh, at least at the time we were doing things, uh, everything is run in a single process, so if something actually like killed the process, everything just died behind it. And if you didn't fix what was killing it, whatever was behind it didn't actually get run and there wasn't a whole lot of visibility behind it. So one of the things that uh, Hunkins um, provides us is you can create jobs for each one of these processes. You don't have to worry about handling scheduling within the code because Hudkins, Jenkins, um, handles all of the scheduling, it handles all of the workers, it'll make sure that none of the processes run in concurrency um, so if you have a long process that every once in a while, let's say it's indexing your site and it goes beyond, let's say, the hour long, it'll make sure that it doesn't run that process twice, which is really important because uh, you'll end up indexing things twice and doing even more work and it'll start to build up. Um, so like I said, uh, it allows us to be able to um, run jobs independently. So um, for example, one of the things that we do is uh, our content producers create content in their, you know, proprietary, economist branded application, and then and then we pull it down through from CCI into our website. Well, all we had to do is simply create a Drush command for uh, uh, running the import into our system. Um, we've done other things where uh, we. We index our search. Um, we can even uh, deploy. Um, the deploy process will probably be talked more by our sys admin, but we have things for every step of the process, the deploy, that can all be done using a GUI so that we can see the output. We can compare it against what we're expecting there to be. Emails get sent out if things fail. Um, I mean, in general, having this system is a great idea. Um, should I talk more? Let me see. Tasks, custom Drush commands. Um, Drush is a great thing. Um, one of the things everyone loves, uh, Drush UpDB. Um, it allows you to be able to um, upgrade your uh, modules and 
if you deploy, a lot of times the deploy process will update modules. But one of the things we did find was um, we don't always want to take down the site when we want to run these long running processes. So usually when you're you're doing an updb, you, you have to take down the site and then you run the updb, check everything out, take the site back up. Well, one of the things that we found out is uh, all you have to do is really run or create a custom drush command. So if you want to run something in the background, just create a drush command. You can even throttle it if you want, if you're worried about the performance. And that uh, gives you an opportunity to run the command to, let's say, import something or update some data, maybe port it from a legacy system, all while the site remains running. Um, so yeah, Drush has been an, an integral part of our system. Thank you. It takes a minute for my microphone to come back on again. Yeah, one of the, the, the Austin team, the first time that this became huge for us is that um, we were integrating topics so that when you went to The Economist, you could look at a topic and then see articles related to that topic. But that meant every article had to be sent to a third party vendor who then you know, gave us back the topics that were related to it, and then that had to be saved. And that's not something that could be done every time an article is saved. That had to be a whole back-end process. And by using a custom drush command, um, getting it out of cron meant we had control. And using a custom drush command is if for some reason we needed to send just one article, we could just put in the node ID of that article, or we can send them all. You know, so that's an example. These kinds of back-end processes, as Judah was saying, like anytime you have to run one, instead of putting it in the whole cron task thing, and you can also add. Um, selectors, right, to make it to make it different, and you can stop it if it's broken and not mess everything else up. Yeah. Um, also, uh, in addition to like just running Drush commands and stuff like that, we um, we run our uh, our test environments through Hudson as well. Um, so, uh, Dom, I believe, mentioned we have test environments, we have our local environments, we have our trunk environments. We also have what we call our HTIs, which are human tests inter. Uh, instances where we can take any of our feature branches and create a version of our website with it with a database with the the source code of that branch and then pull it up in a web browser and have our product owners look at it sign off on it have our UX um, sign off on it and make sure that all the CSS is showing up correctly um, and in addition to that if we want we can run any automated tests against it um, so all of our Selenium tests and simple tests uh, can run against the environments as well. Um, yeah. yeah so we'll talk about the infrastructure now, which um, Cal Yu will, um, who keeps us up and running and reminds us when a query is wreaking havoc and we all he'll 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 send the email to everyone and says you know we've, we've we've come across a query that's starting to back up and all of the developers they scroll down very slowly because you're just really hoping that it's not the table that you added <laughs> last sprint so yeah. right so um i'm going to give a very brief overview of the infrastructure that we have to run our um production production system um so coming from the um, customer side, we, uh, we use the uh, CDN to deliver all the uh, static content, like the images, uh, JavaScript, um, and then the CSS files. Then um, we have a, a hardware uh, load balance solution. And um, we then have two varnish uh, reverse proxy servers to cache the content. Then um, the uh, request goes back to the load balancer and is balanced across 10 Drupal nodes, 10 web heads. Um, and uh, then we do have a memcache layer and the database layer. Um, just to go over the numbers, we have two varnish servers, um, 10 uh, web heads, and four database nodes. So one master database server and three slave servers. Um, so it's a pretty, pretty actually standard setup. Um, we also have a similar setup for the, again, not, again, smaller um, amount of servers, 
but the structure is the same for the staging environment and we also have um, a DR environment that we replicate our data to and uh, in case of uh, a disaster we can then switch to this uh, disaster recovery site. Um, and that's pretty much it. We use um, Jenkins then to um, automate all the um, building and deployment. So uh, deploying to our staging and production environment is um, basically just pressing a um, couple of buttons in the uh, Jenkins uh, user interface, and then that's pretty much it. Okay. Awesome. <coughs> and. Um, performance and so uh, we're at 37 minutes so we still have another 10 minutes or so for um, so I think we're doing good in terms of time um, Judah are you talking performance Judah. I love the spotlight yeah <laughs> okay uh, so let me uh, first read my notes real quick Okay, so um, uh, this is uh, near the end of the um, the Drupal week, so many of you guys probably already heard a lot of the sessions about how to scale Drupal um, and how to make it perform like a rock star. Uh, basically, most if not all the things that you heard in those sessions, we were also figuring out the hard way at the same time. So, um, you know, normal Drupal install, it's fine. It's great. It's great for shared environments. We started building our site on Drupal 6, so um, Drupal 7 is a market improvement. Um, one of the things you figure out really quickly is uh, you need things like memcache and you need things like master slave database. So immediately we knew right off the bat that we needed to go with a different distribution of Drupal 6. Um, that, du that distribution is called Pressflow. Basically, it uh, actually has some patches similar to Drupal 7 but it's backported to Drupal 6 and uh, it, it offers things right out of the box like the master-slave replication and also patches for memcache. Um, uh, of course anyone who runs a server APC is kind of a duh. Um, opcache, there's no need to actually compile your PHP for every single request. Um, it's just something that if you haven't looked up, do it. Uh, it's no loss, very easy to set up. Um, so uh, basically, yeah, the key to any kind of uh, environment is, uh, any kind of scaling is layers of caching. So uh, as we said, there's the CDN and then you go back down and you hit the varnish and almost all of our anonymous is served directly out of varnish and varnish can scale. Um, it can go thousands, millions of requests we haven't even begun to get to tipping over varnish. Um, but there are times where you need to let people through. Um, they're authenticated or they've done some kind of action which potentially they need something uh, different about the page. So let's say you get through that page. Um, you have beautiful things like Drupal page cache and the block cache and those kind of things that, that was built into Drupal and you know, you got to take advantage of. Uh, sometimes things don't always follow that. Uh, it doesn't hit a view, so you can't use view cache. Uh, perhaps the person is logged in, so they need to see things uh, immediately. So Drupal has its own API of cache layer. You know, you can just use cache get, cache set, um, and make sure that any specific query, any specific uh, rendering of HTML can also be wrapped in a, in a, in a cache set. Um, basically one of the problems that we found though, in addition to what came just out of the box, is we needed something in between the node cache, which kind of caches the structure of a node um, and the content of a node, and the actual page cache, which caches everything. Um, so we actually came up with this, and I think it's pretty novel. It's uh, we call it EC cache, but basically it's kind of like the the rendering of the node cache, um, and we've actually extended it so it can render any endpoints, if you will. Um, so all of you guys who have built a menu hook, you set up an endpoint, and that endpoint basically outputs something. So y we hook into that menu hook, and we basically cache whatever it would have rendered. Um, and the great thing about this is you can tweak it for how you cache it. 
So in the same way you can cache based off of uh, a role, you can cache it for the page, the URL, or you can cache it globally. So this allows us to um, possibly even cache some of our, our highly hit pages, uh, like we have our, our sub-indexes, we call them channel pages, and our home pages that we just want to cache. Like, we don't care if you're logged in, we don't care if you're not logged in, we want that cache because we can't afford to recreate that, that node millions of times in a day. Um, so so that, that provided us an opportunity. And, and there are give and takes of that that we, we had to stumble through and figure out, you know, if you're not actually rendering a node, you got to kind of jump through some hoops to make sure you're also storing with that node, not just the HTML, but any other uh, components of the page that is being injected into it. Uh, but it has been a great help. It has helped us to be able to scale the site up. Um, one of the things that we um, have played with and we are going to uh, continue to implement is edge side includes. Uh, it is part of the Akamai network and also part of Varnish that you can cache the page and not a portion of the page um, or don't cache the page. Maybe the page has to be an, uh, authenticated so you can't cache it, but you know, maybe the header or the footer or something doesn't change. Uh, this allows us to kind of uh, handle the caching differently for portions of the page. Um, so yeah, some of this stuff we found out the hard way, but um, in the end, Drupal can scale. It's just how you do it and you have to do it smartly and you have to make sure to use a, a layer of caching. Thanks. Yeah, the um, one of the things that I was saying is going from working on smallish sites to working on the Drupal site was that caching used to be, did you clear your cache in your browser? That's why you're not seeing the change to every, at every level from code writing to pages, you, you're always thinking caching, always, always, always. So, um, so we're, um, we're, we're two minutes from where I wanted to stop for questions, but um, we're going to s go into that a little bit because of course, one of the questions that comes up all the time in talking about The Economist was, uh, it was migrated from, um, from Cold Fusion site, and it took a bit longer than it was originally intended to take. And this question comes up all the time, which is, how come it took you so long? <laughs> and part of the answer is because, and I think this was very smart, that the b adding, adding business value um, constantly during the migration process integrated together, right? So that both new feature development and migration were going on at the same time. Um, and recently the migration has been completed. So JJ is going to walk us through the, it was the steps to how the migration, uh, to how the migration happened. Yeah. Okay. So I've got two minutes to do this. So we started the migration, we finished and done. <laughs> Okay, now um, what we actually did is instead of going for the full big bang, everything all at once, we did it in steps. So we took the uh, comments and things like uh, the recommends and moved them to, my, to uh, Drupal. Then we did things like the articles. So on the Economist website, it's all article pages. So what you're actually hitting for about two years was a cold fusion site, but then every time you went down to an article, you were hitting a Drupal site. So it was a bit confusing for the end person, but they didn't notice because we'd got everything styled the same way. Then for the final part, we did the users. That was quite a large system for The Economist because we have subscriber details which come from various third parties. We have two or three different third parties which can do subscribers. We also had things like coming along like the iPhone, the Android apps. All of them wanted details and access to the subscribers. There's various other third parties that also feed off the Economist user database. So that was the largest one, hence why that's now done. We've shut down the old system and we're fully on Drupal. As we were doing this though, what you'll actually notice is we did the articles two years ago. People were still editing the articles up until about six months ago on the old system. So although the end users were viewing the articles in Drupal, editors were still automating, changing in the old system. So we had to have a continual synchronization process which took any changes from the old system 
and migrated them across. And how we did this was we wrote our own custom modules to get the data out of the Oracle database and move them across, but we also used the migrate and the table wizards so we could just pull various data across from our Oracle tables, which we pulled into the MySQL, and translate them straight into the MySQL tables for Drupal. So the actual articles were... Ah, and now we're talking about the Denver Mountain. This is very nice if you want to go skiing here. <laughs> oh, okay. So, um, from a... <laughs> this kind of throws you, doesn't it? Sorry, I don't even know where it is. The <laughs> yeah, you did deliberately, just for me. So when we were migrating, the tools we were using were the Drupal Migrate tool wrote by, I think, Curve and Motion Co. And the Tail Wizards. Once we then migrated, we turned off our synchronization process because we were only on Drupal for articles. We kept it going though for the users because the users were still coming across. So when you went and subscribed to The Economist, you were going to the old system, pulling it across. When we were getting towards the end, it was a case of all teams come together. So as you noticed earlier, we had three teams geologically located around the world. For the last probably three months, everybody was working on the one thing to kill our old system. So everybody took a different part, be it creating an index page, creating a job site, everything got moved across to the new system. And that's kind of why it take, took three years, yeah. about three years. Yeah. So now we are two, three weeks into the, about three weeks, three or four weeks, we've been purely running on solely Drupal. The on the morning when we actually did our code release, which was a Tuesday, we released the code at about 9 o'clock, and by about half 9, all of the old servers were turned off, decommissioned, completely nuked. So there was no going back. We were going forward. And that's where we are. Yeah, and so it was a boring day. Wasn't it a boring day? Yeah, it was. Yeah, well, maybe not so much for Because you, it's a geological location. The guys in the States came in, and it was all done, dusted. No panics. It was a boring day for us. Yeah, it was yeah. good for you, hmm. yeah. So now I think we're about to open for questions. Okay, yeah, so yeah. we're open for questions. Eric, is there anything that you want to add before we do questions? He's good? Okay, all right. I think questions are probably more um, more what we want to do. So let's see. Questions. Questions? I will, here, you know what we'll do? We'll go like that. Well, it's a very easy question. How many modules are you using on the Economist site? How and many what modules? Yeah. Uh, contributed modules or custom modules? Both. Okay. Yeah. So how many modules? There's what? 7,492,000? <laughs> Does anyone know the exact number? I, I believe around 40 or 50. 40 or 50. Custom or contributed or both together? Both together. I think uh, contributed were around 38, 39. Only because I'm doing that reorganization folder. Right. Thing. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So on, so on that order. Probably fi uh, 40 or 50 altogether. Yeah. Half are custom, half are contributed ish. I'd say about 70 30. 70 30 yeah. custom to contributed. Yeah. 60 40, 70 30, somewhere around there. There's a lot of custom, a lot of custom code. Yeah. A lot, a lot. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's, yeah, a lot. Yeah. So you have subscriber only content on your site, yeah? Yeah. Um, so you have to have authenticated users or logged in subscriber roles. Yep. How does that affect your performance when they come to look at articles that only that they have to be checked on against the database, basically? Uh, so you're asking about uh, authenticated users who come through who have a subscription. Um, we, yeah, we, they're really just authenticated users because they have a role, um, and that role allows them the subscription. Um, if you actually probably the paywall. Um, Dom can probably talk more to this, but um, we have a paywall also. Um, but so yeah, so they're they're authenticated users. Oh, uh, I can answer that. Oh. Um, we actually have. We have a fairly small percentage of people on a regular basis that are coming in in a logged in state. Uh, a lot, the bulk of our traffic is anonymous. If that shifts dramatically, uh, we'll probably have to take some different views. Uh, including, you know, some of the ESIs and, and the way we cache different parts of pages. Um, but right now, it's a low percentage of people view the site in an authenticated state. So you usually see, if it did go off, it will have an effect on performance. Yeah. Yeah. And, and as you said, we have to look at the way we cache bits. Okay. You know, 
know, maybe using varnish in a different way, uh, or ESIs particularly. Yeah, so now at the, it's 10 minutes, right? Yeah. Uh, 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 varnish, um, the uh, expiry five, time, uh, five minutes, five, five minutes, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, my question is, uh, do you, do the team use some uh, project management system and uh, how do you make the work assignment? Thank you. Oh, okay. The, um, when Rebecca, were, were you, Rebecca um, is our scrum master and we use Agile. Do you want to say mm -hmm. a little bit? Um, was the question about the tools that we use? Okay. Um, well, like I said, we, we use uh, we use Scrum, which is an agile project uh, um, or product development framework. As far as the actual tools, we've gone very lo-fi, um, and we mostly use Google Docs um, to uh, we have a backlog of what are all the features, um, and um, that's that's in a Google spreadsheet. Um, we do burn down charts with with spreadsheets in Google, um, and basically we also use that as a wiki. For, for documentation. Um, uh, we've looked at it and we've tried a few different tools for, um, for organizing and we found that the time it took to update them often wasn't worth it. Um, as far as like the day-to-day -day of the team of wh who's, what we're working on, um, with the teams in, um, in New York, for instance, we just use a task board, a physical task board with post-it notes. Um, so we just list out what are the, um, what are the user stories or the features that we've committed to for, for that two-week iteration. And, um, and, and it's very lo-fi. It makes it, um, we do the 15-minute um, meeting every day, looking at that board to update it and move things across. So it, it means that we don't spend a lot of time updating, um, updating um, a tool um, and more time just everyone talking together and um, and it's very transparent where things are. It, it also helps because then other people in the office can walk around and, and they can see exactly what's being worked on. Um, for the Austin team, because some of them were remote um, in Austin and some in New York, um, we do that task board on, on Google Docs as well. We just make a very, very simple spreadsheet of um, um, stuff that, that hasn't been started, uh, not started, in progress, and done, and um, very, very simple. Yeah, Eric? Uh, I just, yeah. Do we still use Unfuddle at all? Um, we use Unfuddle for, bu for bug management. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. Okay? Okay. I think, how are we doing? Two more. Okay. Yeah, I know it's That's fine. very low tech. Um, how do you work with estimations as to how to you plan your job? How do you reach an estimate that you trust? Sure. Um, this is something that um, we do um, with Agile Scrum. We use the concept of story points, uh, which is rather than getting into the trap of um, trying to estimate exactly how many hours or how many days something's going to take, um, um, the the product owner will put together, here's here's a description of what we want. Um, we work with the team to make sure that's clear, have some conversation about it, and also come up with a what we call a how to demo description of like, this is how, if you went through these steps, basically it's, it's like the UAT steps of uh, what a user would do. And um, we get together with the team to do a session of what we call planning poker. Um, and uh, we size it, basically it's, it's relative sizes um, on the Fibonacci sequence. So it's like, uh, um, one, two, five, eight, thirteen, is that what it is? And, and so we give, them, we give them relative sizes for, for each slice of functionality that we're looking at. Um, and um, with that, we, we take into each two weeks what we think we're going to get done. And um, after you've done a couple of sprints, you, you get an idea of like how much you can get done. And, um, and you only take in that number of points. It gets us out of the game of like what, exactly how many hours, but more of what's the relative, um, the relative um, effort. Um, and the commitment is then uh, at, in the planning of, of the team says, okay, based on this whole conversation we've had and what we understand of the relative size of these things, then we commit to getting these things done in the next two weeks. And that's that's the commit. Yeah. And, and 
in terms of um, for, for planning and forecasting, I mean, when you, when you go with an agile approach, you can manage to time or you can manage to feature set. So if the feature set is there's a, a minimum feature set you want, then you have to be flexible in the amount of time it takes to deliver. If you want to time box it, then you have to be flexible in mm -hmm. what you're going to deliver. So uh, for the past couple of years, we've, we've kind of delivered on a minimum feature set and then said, oh, okay, it looks about done. Um, for our next round of development, we're going to be looking at more tightly time boxing it. And the idea is to really get the teams and the product owners to really think about those bits of functionality that's a, that are going to deliver the most, you know, the biggest bang for the buck. Um, in our experience, you know, the Pareto principle actually works. We get through about, you know, when we've gone and done these extensive, huge uh, backlogs of everything we can think of to do, we usually get through around 20% of it, and we wind up chucking the rest away. <laughs> so um, mm -hmm. the, the, the thing about that is there's, there was time and effort in that bottom 20%. So we're going to try and approach this time where we say, okay, you know, you've got um, a budget of four sprints or eight weeks. You know, what are the really high value features that we can do? And can we get a viable product out and kind of challenge ourselves that way? Um, and that's how we try to manage expectations upward as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, unfortunately, we're at, we've actually used extra time, right? We're out of time. You want to have an hour? Yeah. So, 40, right, because we started at 2.45, so 3.45 is when we're supposed to end for coffee. We're keeping you from coffee, and look, you have stayed with us. So, thank you very much. And, and, you know, this, they found out yesterday afternoon at, like, 4 in the afternoon that they were going to be doing this today, and I think they did a phenomenal job. And, and great. Thank you for coming. <laughs>